this meeting is going to be recorded. Um, so everyone should see that pop up on their screen. Uh, just to confirm, can everybody hear me? Yes. Great, thank you. Um, so my name is Rebecca Framow. I'm the Digital Preservation Manager uh, at GBH uh, Archives uh, here in Boston. Um, and I also am sort of the primary contact for the PP Core uh, metadata standard, which is what we're going to be talking about over the course of this series. So thank you all for joining me today. Um, so just for some background, PP Core was originally funded by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, uh, and GBH, which is the public media station in Boston, took over responsibility for the schema in 2014 as part of the American Archive of Public Broadcasting Initiative. Since then, NEH has funded two rounds of development on PB Core. Uh, the first was the PB Core Development and Training Project, which supported the development of the new website and tools that we're going to be talking about later in this course, uh, plus the current PB Core Education and Training Project, which has funded these, these webinars. We're delighted to be working with NEDCC to deliver these webinars, uh, and we're excited to leverage their experience in providing online education to the cultural heritage community. Uh, since this is the first course in the series, before we begin, I just kind of want to give you guys an overview of the, the sort of pathway that this class is going to take. So the class course is going to consist of five classes. Today uh, is really going to be background. We're going to be focusing on just kind of some general concepts in audiovisual metadata that underlie uh, a lot of the decisions made around the PP Core metadata standard and why the elements and attributes and structure of it are the way they are. So this might be review for some of you who have been pretty familiar with working with audiovisual materials. Um, for others who, you know, maybe just are starting to work with audiovisual materials, uh, some of this may be new information. Um, anytime something comes up, it's going to be probably more technical terminology heavy today than at any other point in the course. So if I'm going to quickly or if any questions come up, uh, my colleague Casey is monitoring the chat. Please feel free to drop a question in there at any time. Um, and then after today's class, um, we're going to be sort of diving a little more deep into the standard itself. So tomorrow or next week, um, we're going to be talking about the structure of PB Core, uh, how the records are organized, how to draw relationships between, you know, kind of conceptual content and the actual specific items that you might want to record when you're cataloging. Um, in the third class, we're going to be talking about controlled vocabularies and terminology, and that's when we're really going to be kind of doing a deep dive into the actual elements and attributes um, and terminology that we use within the PB Core schema itself. In the fourth class, we're going to be spending the whole time focusing on using the PB Core cataloging tool, um, which is a tool that we developed as part of the earlier grant that I mentioned to kind of assist with the drawing up basic PB Core XML documents, um, but which is also just a really useful learning tool for PB Core itself, and I think really helps to gain familiarity with the schema. And finally, in the fifth course, we're going to be talking about mapping and database modeling and kind of the real world use cases for PB Core. Um, the each class up until the last class is going to start out with me just kind of lecturing the way I'm doing now, um, and then the last half hour to 20 minutes of the class, we'll be doing a cataloging exercise. Um, the last class is gonna be a little bit different since it's sort of hard to exercise out mapping and database modeling in a way that uh, can really be encompassed in within an hour long course. Um, we're gonna have a briefer lecture that time and then we're gonna spend the rest of that class talking about case studies uh, and some of the questions that you guys have raised over the course of the actual uh, lecture series. So that's what the next six weeks, because we have one break in the middle, uh, is going to look like. Um, again, if you have questions about that, feel free to hit me up in the chat or shoot me an email. Um, finally, before we dive into today's class, I just want to warn you that the room I'm sitting in has uh, motion augmented lights. So there may be a couple times over the course of this lecture when I have to get up and do a little dance to turn the lights back on. Uh, that's maybe a good time to ask questions if you had any. <laughs> uh, so we'll see how it goes. Uh, so first of all, I just kind of want to ask you guys uh, why, you know, why you're here today. Why do you think accurate metadata is so important for audiovisual collections uh, that we're having a whole five course seminar um, to talk specifically about audiovisual metadata as distinct from other kinds of metadata? Um, why, why is it valuable to collect this information? Does anybody have suggestions? Please feel free to drop them in the chat. I'll give it about a minute. Yep, uh, it's important that it, you know, it makes the material searchable and discoverable. Yep. 
It helps to manage the materials. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it does help to link data across institutions. Uh, these are all really great answers. So AV material has no intelligence without metadata. Uh, it's a very good and poetic way to put it. Um, makes it more accessible to users. Absolutely. Uh, it takes a long time to evaluate a sound file with that description. That's really true. And the time-based nature of audiovisual material is one of the things that kind of sets it apart from other kind of material that you might need to catalog. So the answers that I sort of came up with when I was sitting down asking myself why we were offering this class um, is first of all, discoverability, as many of you have pointed out, without accurate metadata, users just simply can't find what they need in the collections. Second, uh, it's valuable for metrics. Metadata documents the format, age, uniqueness, and risk factors for your collections, and all of those can generate funding for preservation activities. Um, when you're writing a grant to try and preserve your materials, uh, generally speaking, the more information you have about those materials, um, the better sense that your funders are going to have for what the need is um, and why they should, you know, kind of prioritize preserving those materials above anything else. Finally, uh, it's really important to have metadata for preservation planning. Um, knowing and understanding the technical characteristics of your materials helps you make decisions around the preservation of materials, like deciding on digital preservation formats or estimating your preservation budget or planning how much storage you're going to need once you've digitized all of those 16 millimeter film reels you have sitting in your collection. Um, so all of those things are why uh, AV has some kind of like specific technical terms that we think are probably important to capture in most cases. And that's what I'm gonna be kind of walking through during the course of this particular session. So my next question are, what are the two factors that make audiovisual media unusually complex? Um, the first is its unique technical characteristics, um, which are sort of distinct and require specific fields to capture um, that are maybe a little bit more specific than in many other non-AV specific metadata standards. And the second is the production workflow of audiovisual materials, which is really collaborative um, and a little more complicated than perhaps for many other materials that may be found in an archive. And obviously this is different depending on the types of audiovisual content that uh, one is talking about. There are a lot of different types of audiovisual content ranging from, you know, ranging from commercial films, which go through a very complicated uh, production cycle and have a number of participants, you know, working on them kind of at every stage of the process, um, to a home movie, which might be recorded on one person's camera and, you know, has maybe kind of a less complex life cycle to document and to try and talk about when you're capturing the metadata about it. So we're gonna to return to the slide about types of audiovisual content um, and how that impacts on the metadata that you might want to capture about them a little later in the presentation. But for right now, I'm just gonna focus on the technical characteristics and I'm just gonna kind of go through really quickly uh, the technical characteristics that are unique to audiovisual material um, and what we might wanna know about them. So first, as just kind of one key point, as uh, has already been kind of pointed out in the chat, audiovisual material media is time-based media. That means that you know, you're gonna have a certain amount of time that you need to document specific metadata about for every second of that time, which means that you're gonna end up with a lot more metadata than for a still image uh, or a single document that doesn't kind of doesn't have that time span, that, that third dimension to, con to contend with when you're trying to describe it. Um, in terms of a film, it's kind of easy to imagine this. It's, it's a series of still images. So if you're talking about one still image, when you're trying to catalog a film, obviously you're not gonna catalog every still image that makes up a film individually, but still speaking, you know, that's a lot more metadata. It's basically one film is sort of like a collection of still images that you have to try and describe on the level of a single item. Um, it's sort of less easy to visualize when you're talking about audio or a digital file or, you know, an anal uh, magnetic media file. Um, but you can see kind of from this just audio graph that you have different points on that line of time, time based concept. Uh, and you're trying to capture as much metadata around those points as you can in order to replicate that media again. So some of the unique technical characteristics of AV media uh, include the format, the standard, the duration, um, tracks, interlacing, the question of interlacing, playback speed, frame rate, sampling rate, bit depth, aspect ratio, and data rate. And I'm just gonna kind of go through all of these to give you a general sense of what these mean um, when you see them in audiovisual metadata. Uh, again, if I go too fast through any of these, um, 
please don't hesitate to ask a question or you know if anything seems confusing i'm happy to clarify so first of all when we're talking about the format of audiovisual media we can mean a couple of different things if you're talking about the world of just physical items the physical format uh, is going to mean something like is it an audio tape or is it a dvd uh, or is it a reel of film and then if it is one of those characters you know speaking drilling down a little more deeply uh, is it a beta cam tape or is it a umatic tape or is it a vhs tape um, is it a writable DVD or is it a commercial DVD? Is it 16 millimeter film or 35 millimeter film? Um, getting familiar with kind of the different formats of AV, especially now that a lot of them are legacy formats that don't appear very much in daily life uh, is kind of one of the, I think, hurdles to getting comfortable with audiovisual media. Um, but, you know, the, the bright side is that a lot of these formats do kind of have their name written on them very large, like with this beta camp tape. Uh, and it is important to understand what formats you're dealing with before you can undertake preservation activities. In order to play back a Betacam tape, you need a Betacam deck. Uh, in order to calculate how much, you know, how large the file that's digitized from your reel, reel of film is, you need to know whether it's 16 millimeter or 35 millimeter, maybe be able to estimate how long it is and kind of understanding more information about those different formats is going to really help in making preservation decisions. If we're talking about a digital format of audiovisual media, um, then again, uh, we're talking about a different kind of complexity. With audiovisual media, you're um, generally you're going to be talking about both the codec and the wrapper of your digital file. Uh, so the codec is going to be a specific description of how that uh, audio or video stream is encoded. Um, and that's going to be something like uh, H.264 or uncompressed video uh, or Matroska or JPEG 2000 um, or PCM audio. Uh, and that, you know, kind of defines the, the specific structure of the bits and bytes that will translate on your computer to a sound that you can hear and a movie that you can see. Then that codec is going to be wrapped in kind of a more standard container that can be easily interpreted by most of the tools of playback media like QuickTime.mov uh, or Windows Media, if anyone remembers that, WMV. Um, and that's going to dictate, you know, sort of the structure of how that gets passed around from, from place to place. So understanding the difference between a codec and a wrapper and what the different characteristics of those audio and video codecs are, um, things like frame, you know, bit rate uh, and sampling rate and so forth uh, are also really important when you're managing your audiovisual files and understanding both a physical format and a digital format. Um, when you're talking about digitization, when you're talking about digital preservation of media uh, and being able to describe those is really key. Um, standard is something that comes from the realm of legacy media a little bit. Um, video is broadcast in accordance with uh, certain technical standards put into place by the television and broadcast authorities of different areas which is primarily related to the way that the lines and color of an image are encoded. Uh, tape recorded in one standard will not play back on a deck that's designed for a different standard. Um, so in America, most of our tapes are encoded you know, with NTSC. Uh, if your collection though happens to deal with media that might be coming from Europe or from uh, China or different regions, uh, you might be dealing with a magnetic media that's encoded in a different standard, and then you're going to have to undertake different preservation activities accordingly. Duration. This one's a pretty easy one. You're dealing with time-based media. You have to know how much time it's going to take up. Um, so this is, I think, pretty conceptually simple, but again, it's unique to AV. You're not going to have duration, you know, you're not going to need to know the actual duration of a file when you're looking at a PDF. Um, so tracks, video and audio media often have multiple tracks of audio. Sometimes these represent different musical elements before they're edited into a whole. Uh, sometimes they represent dialogue coming together with music or they might contain alternate language tracks or narration or descriptive audio services. Um, again, this is the kind of information that you can't necessarily find just by, you know, you're not gonna, by just looking at a file on your computer without opening it or by, you know, looking at a audio reel that's in your collection. Um, if this metadata isn't recorded, the only way to discover it is by actually, you know, digitizing the media or playing back the media. So capturing it can be really helpful for, again, kind of making those decisions without having to examine every item in your collection one by one. 
interlacing. This may look familiar to some of you, and maybe uh, for those of you who don't remember magnetic and analog television times as well, might look less familiar. Um, this is a technique that was used in the analog broadcast era to lessen the bandwidth required to send information by using a trick of the human eye. Uh, interlacing doesn't translate well to the frame by frame aspect of digital video. Um, you can kind of see that this interlaced video, um, which on an old uh, cathode ray tube television would be invisible to someone watching it, shows as these kind of like little wavy lines um, in this video here, that's the example um, when it's kind of taken as a screenshot of a digital file. Um, so deciding what to do about interlacing artifacts can be a complex choice when preserving archival video. As archivists, we want to preserve the original um, and we want to make sure that we're not losing any technical characteristics, um, but also uh, we want to make sure that we understand that if these materials are gonna be maybe reused in production, people are probably not gonna to wanna to see those artifacts. And so we're gonna to have to maybe spin off derivatives that remove them and uh, you know, make that kind of part of our workflow for sharing materials. Playback speed. Um, this is pretty unique to open real audio which was designed to have the ability to record at different speeds. Recording at a lower speed could capture more content on the tape at a lower quality, sort of the equivalent of a long play VHS tape. Without knowing what speed the media was recorded at, the content will not play back correctly. So again, having this metadata captured, if you happen to have open real audio in your collection, uh, is going to really help if you send it out to a vendor or try and digitize it. Frame rate. This is the number of frames that are displayed over the course of one second of video. In the United States, film was generally played at 24 frames per second, while color television was usually broadcast at 29.97 frames per second. Uh, if you ask me why 29.97, uh, it's because black and white video was broadcast at 30 frames per second, and the engineers had to lower the frame rate to allow for color information to be transmitted. Um, and that's why we kind of end up with this weird number, which has been carried forward into most production uh, workflows today. If you don't play the video back at the right frame rate, again, it's going to look weird. It's going to you know, be a little sped up or slowed down. Uh, so representing the media um, as it was meant to be represented is going to, knowing that frame rate um, for an analog file uh, is going to be key. Sampling rate is similar to frame rate. It's the number of audio samples tracked for, or sorry, it's not similar to frame rate, it's similar to bit rate, which I'm gonna talk about later. Uh, it's the number of audio samples that are tracked for every second of audio. So when you're digitizing an audio file, a higher sampling rate will create a richer sound, which replicates more closely the analog curve of how our ear hears a sound wave. Um, so you can kind of see in this graph, which I found very useful over the years, um, if you imagine, kind of a, a, a wave curve, the, the curve of a wave file. Um, and you imagine that, you know, you're gonna capture it, at, you know, take a sample at eight points along that curve. You're not going to get as close to the original experience of listening to that magnetic original analog sound as if you take it 16 or 24, 16 samples or 24 samples. Um, so when you're doing a digitization as bit depth and sample rate increase, more information is camp captured, which results in higher quality audio. Uh, in audio, on, we saw on the last slide, bit depth refers to the number of bits of information that are used in each audio sample. So you see how we've kind of got these building blocks uh, that contain the digital information that are being sampled um, for each curve of the, you know, each moment in time along the sound wave. Um, we can also take, you know, in addition to taking more samples, we can also have a richer variety of different kinds of tone that can be represented, um, which is, and that's sort of what we, what we refer to as bit depth. In video, bit depth actually refers to something a little different. It refers to the number of bits that are used to indicate the color of a single pixel. Uh, as with sampling rate and audio bit depth, greater video bit depth allows the opportunity to describe a greater range of colors in the digital file. Um, so this is important when you're making decisions about digitization for both audio and video. Um, and when you're looking at the digital media that you have, and you're saying, what is my highest quality file, which is the one that's closest to the analog original. Um, in most cases, when you're going from analog to digital, you're going to be looking at 10 bit for video because that's going to be the richest range of color. Um, if you're going from something that was maybe born digital 
uh, 8 bit is often pretty standard for high quality video representation. So it really depends on the context. Aspect ratio describes the width and height of an image on the screen. An image played back on the wrong aspect ratio will look squashed or elongated. Um, and sometimes uh, you might be looking at a digital file that for whatever reason has been captured the wrong aspect ratio. Uh, and being able to kind of recognize that and say this, you know, and having metadata that indicates what the correct aspect ratio should be um, will help you again, represent, preserve that file correctly and represent it correctly. Data rate is the size of the video file per second of data. The data rate can vary based on how much information the video file contains at any given point. Um, you can all choose to have either have a variable or a constant data rate when you're doing a digitization project or when you're creating a file. Um, often you're going to get kind of better files by allowing for a variable data rate, um, but a constant data rate, you know, kind of sets a hard limit on how big the data rate is going to be. So, for example, when we're creating proxies for the American Archive of Public Broadcasting and we transcode, we set a constant data rate um, just to make sure that none of the proxies get too big and we don't kind of overblow our storage size. So, again, understanding what the data rate is, um, is going to kind of give you a better sense of the quality of your video file. So before I dive into talking about the production workflow and kind of the other complex elements of audiovisual material, I do want to pause and see if anybody has questions or comments about any of the kind of technical terms relating to audiovisual media that I've just talked about. So I'm going to give it about a minute to see if anybody has questions. Um, I see that we have a question about explaining data rate again. Sure, I'm gonna go back to that slide. Um, so it's basically the size of the video file per second of data. So again, this is how it relates to time-based media, right? So if you're looking at an MP4 file, because there's different you know, kind of amounts of data contained in that file every second that it's playing. You know, sometimes the file might be showing just a straight green screen or a straight black screen. And that's not gonna, you're not gonna need very much data to represent that green screen or that black screen to the viewer. Uh, and sometimes uh, you're gonna have a second of media that has, you know, a beautiful orchestra playing and figures dancing across the screen and all kinds of sort of complex images that need a lot more data to represent accurately. So this data rate, um, which is something that you're gonna see for specifically audiovisual files, um, will sort of track the different amounts of data that are required to present the image to uh, and the sound to a viewer for each second of that file. Um, so this is not something, again, that you'll worry about with a still image or a PDF. Um, it's specific to audiovisual metadata and audiovisual digital files. Um, I also have a question about EASA TC04 and TC06 as guidelines that contain a lot of definitions and descriptions. Um, I admit I don't know as much about those standards as I do about PV Core, uh, but I think that that's a great recommendation um, and something that we can definitely talk about next time. All right, I'm going to move on now to talk a little bit about the production workflow, which is the other kind of complex element of audiovisual material. So. When you're talking about audiovisual media, you're often going to have multiple elements that go into a final product for broadcast or distribution. Not all media goes through this kind of workflow, um, but if we're talking about something that you know is going out through Hollywood or going out through a major television studio, generally you're gonna start with something like raw footage, narration, music effects, all the kind of original elements that go into a production. So someone goes out into the field with a camera, uh, or with a sound recorder, um, someone's talking into a microphone uh, and they're, you know, taking the outtakes and they're doing the, you know, the different kind of actual content creation. Then after you've create, captured all those, you know, bits of content that are going to go into the product, you have your intermediate materials. You have a rough cut, which is, you know, maybe kind of an original edit of the program. 
you have your Avid Media files or your uh, Final Cut Pro files, um, which are what you're using to kind of do that edit and assemble the media together. Or you have, if you're talking about a legacy workflow, uh, you have interpositives and internegatives, um, which are you know kind of the intermediate uh, film elements that go between positive and negative uh, film reels uh, that are sent out for viewing. And finally, uh, you're going to have your final material. So that's going to be a broadcast master, a distribution master, an international master. Um, and if you're an audiovisual archivist who's maybe, you know, received a, working within a production environment or has received a donation from a filmmaker of all their materials, um, you're going to want to look at these different elements and figure out what it's most important to prioritize for preservation uh, and how to kind of give users a guide as to what they're going to want to access. Obviously not all media goes through this kind of workflow. So if you think back to the slide on types of audiovisual content, um, some things that are probably going to go through this kind of workflow are commercial film, a television episode, uh, obviously television series also, maybe a radio program or an album. Um, something that might not go through this kind of workflow might be a home movie, an event recording, uh, an oral history, a podcast, a TikTok video, or a piece of surveillance footage, uh, which mostly in those cases, what you have, the element, is the element that you have. These things are more likely to be unique um, and as thus are at greater risk and maybe a higher priority for preservation. Audio and material, visual material, as I mentioned before, is also often collaborative. So uh, in, you know, instead of just having a simple author, uh, as you might for an article or several authors, um, you're going to have you know various people who are involved in the production of the media, like a producer, a director, an editor, a writer, an actor, a cinematographer. Um, the information that's important to capture about who is involved in the creation of a piece is going to be different for each institution. So it's important to think in advance about what will be important to your users when you're starting to you know, decide what kind of information about creators and contributors to an audiovisual material that you're going to capture. For example, a composer might be a minor role in the creation of a television episode with some incidental music. And if you're you know, working in a television archive, you might not prioritize capturing all the composers that work on kind of theme songs for your collection. On the other hand, a composer is obviously gonna be the major role in the creation of an album. And that's something that you probably want to prioritize capturing. So when you're making decisions about how you're going to catalog audiovisual materials um, and how you're going to kind of build your databases and your forms and, and really uh, prioritize that data, this is the kind of thing that it's useful to think about in advance. So since we've kind of walked through a bunch of the things that make audiovisual material specific and that uh, a lot of the underlying kind of decisions and assumptions that went into the design of PB Core, um, I'm gonna jump back and talk a little bit about Dublin Core, which uh, I'm imagining many of you are familiar with Dublin Core. It's a metadata standard that's designed to be simple and understandable, uh, and it consists of only 15 elements. And when Dublin Core was created, uh, you know, the people who kind of came together on a committee uh, and determined what these elements were gonna be, decided that those elements could describe a document or a book very completely, and they can. This has, you know, Dublin Core uh, is both simple and understandable, um, and contains a lot of the key information that many institutions will need for their non-time-based materials. PB Core was designed to be as simple as possible based on the, the simple premise of Dublin Core. But because of all these uh, various elements that make public broadcasting materials in specific and audiovisual materials in general a little more complicated, uh, they added a number of elements that the original creators who were public media professionals felt were important to accurately describe the content that they were creating. Um, so here's a list of the asset level elements in PB Core. Uh, you'll see that some of these things are in red. Those are required elements. All of this is stuff we're gonna talk about a little more when we start talking about the structure of PB Core and the controlled vocabularies that are used within PB Core over the next two weeks. Unlike Dublin Core, PB Core is also a multi-level standard. So in addition to these asset level elements, which describe content, PB Core also has a series of elements called instantiation elements that are intended to describe the technical carrier of the media. So things like a tape, uh, a reel of film, um, an audiovisual file, you know, an MP4 file, uh, a WAV file. And you'll recognize a lot of these elements 
as some of the technical terminology regarding audiovisual media that we just kind of did an overview of throughout the rest of this session. Um, so all of these are pieces of technical information that the creators of PB Core felt was important to capture. Um, and we'll talk again more about this in next week's presentation on the structure of PB Core um, and about, you know, kind of what you do with all these technical elements and what, you know, are maybe the best ways to try and capture this information. So I'm going to pause again here and ask if we have any questions before I ask everyone to take like 15 to 20 minutes to work on an exercise. I'd also like to jump back since the exercise is going to focus on Dublin Core for today. Uh, I want to make sure that everyone has a good understanding of Dublin Core, uh, or if anyone has any questions about the Dublin Core elements and what they mean uh, and how to kind of capture that information that uh, we want to talk about before I launch into the exercise. Uh, discuss instantiation concept, sure. Uh, so again, we're gonna be talking a little bit more about instantiations in the next couple sessions. Um, but the concept of an instantiation is your asset, these things that, you know, the asset elements describe is your specific, um, your, the, the film, the television episode, um, you know, at episode one of Downton Abbey, uh, conceptually, the concept of that episode. So, you know, description, what's the plot, who acted in it, um, what's the genre, what's the subject. The instantiation is intended to capture the specific carrier of that content. So, you know, for every episode of Downton Abbey, there are thousands of DVDs and VHS tapes uh, and production elements that, that are associated with that episode. Each of those things is an instantiation and they all have different unique technical characteristics. So the instantiation elements describe the unique specific technical characteristic of your specific DVD, whereas the asset describes the actual episode and the content that goes into that episode. Um, as far as the relation field for Dublin Core, sure, I'm happy to talk about that. Um, this is intended to indicate whether the specific thing that you're cataloging has a relationship to some another asset within your collection. So uh, say, for example, um, that your article is a sequel to a previous article um, or you know, a response to it, you might use that to catalog in the relation field. Um, say that my uh, a lot of my um, sort of big go-to examples are in the realm of audiovisual media, say that your digital file was digitized from origi an original tape or an original CD, uh, that would be a relationship that you might also want to catalog. Um, in PB Core, uh, you have the option to kind of describe both the relationship and the relation type. Um, Dublin Core allows you to do that in linked data, but not as much in kind of its simple XML standard, which is, since we're staying simple today, uh, it's just, uh, it's a little bit less rich as far as being able to be specific about that. Um, you remind me the difference in relation with format and type in DC. Um, so I believe that format uh, is intended to simply describe, you know, is it a book? Is it an article? Uh, is it a videotape? Um, and type uh, describes whether it's, you know, the format is the actual sort of carrier of the thing and type is the type of content. So is it text? Is it media? Is it audiovisual? Um, whereas format would be like cassette uh, or book. Um, but let me double check on that just to make sure I'm giving you the right information. Um, that's the second question about the distinction between format and type. So I will double check on that once we get launched into the exercise uh, and report back. But let me first kind of give you a, you know, describe the exercise so people can get started on it. Um, and you also should have access to a form that talks about this exercise and kind of provides a simple way to catalog in Dublin Core without having to, you know, open up an XML uh, reader in the class folder that you should have been given access to in an email. Um, let me know if you do, for anyone who doesn't have access to that class folder already, uh, I will drop another link to that in the chat. 
Um, so the exercise is simply to find a piece of audiovisual content in your home, whether that's a VHS tape, a DVD, or a CD, or a video on your cell phone, um, and then use the Dublin Core cataloging form that was kind of attached to the exercise to capture as much information as you can about your content. What is the format? Does it have a title and a description? Can you come up with these things? Uh, and then after you've kind of filled out the Dublin Core form, I'd like you to list any important characteristics of your item that you had questions about how to record in Dublin Core. Um, so think about you know, the things that we've talked about over the course of the class today. Think about the, the technical content of audiovisual media um, and the, the sort of production workflow um, and the different kind of creators that might have gone into it. Uh, and whether you can catalog all of that in double core or whether there are things that you'd maybe like different fields to be able to capture. Uh, so we're gonna have, let's see, it's six past one now and we have till 1.30. Uh, so I'm gonna give you guys about 15 minutes to complete this exercise. Um, the Dublin core form that's in the, so the, the form for the exercise that's in the class folder should have the exercise on page one and the Dublin core form on page two. Please download that and fill that out on your own personal computer, just so we don't have everyone trying to jump in and use the same shared document. Um, the Dublin Core form should look like this. Let me jump in and share it one moment. So I'm going to stop sharing for just a second, or rather I'm going to stop this presentation for just a second so that I can uh, share the Dublin Core form. So this is what the form looks like. Um, it's just a Word document that has the Dublin Core elements on one side and then fields where you can enter your responses uh, on the other side. Um, and I'm gonna keep this up for a couple minutes and then I'll go back to sharing the presentation with the exercise. And let me just real quick fully confirm the difference between format and type in Dublin Core. So if everyone wants to get started on the exercise, uh, and I will answer that question. Um, and if questions come up for you while you're doing the exercise, feel free to drop them in the chat. Uh, and we'll all come back together again um, at 1.20. Uh, and then we'll have kind of a conversation about the experience that you guys had doing this exercise. All right, so to confirm, yes, the type in Dublin Core is the nature or genre of a resource. Uh, the Dublin Core controlled vocabulary uh, suggests using terms for this like uh, data set, collection, image, moving image, physical object. Um, whereas the format uh, is intended to be the file format, physical medium or dimensions of the resource. Uh, so you might use a MIME type for this. Uh, examples of dimensions might include size and duration. Um, so that's you know basically providing more specificity around the uh, format of the type of media that you're describing. Thank you, Peter, for sharing the link.
And now uh, if everyone's had a chance to download the form and get the exercise, I'm just gonna go back to sharing my presentation. I've had a question to explain relation again. Um, so basically, relation is the way in which one item might indicate relate to another item in the collection. So is it you know part one or two of a set? Is it a sequel? Is it something that was made? Is it a remake? Is it something that was made from uh, you know by digitizing or by uh, restoring or anything like that from one uh, original medium to another? For this particular exercise, 
the thing that you pick may not be related to anything else in your personal collection, by which I mean your home or office, and that's totally okay. Uh, not every element in the form needs to be filled out. Uh, the whole idea behind a metadata schema is to provide an opportunity to capture as much information as you may need in a place to organize that, um, but not necessarily to require that you actually capture all of those things. Rebecca, it looks like we have another question in about uh, asking for an example of source. Great, thank you. Uh, one moment. So, Source is sort of overlaps a little with relation. It's a, intended to be a related resource from which the described resource is derived. Um, so this might be, uh, I believe that the way this is generally used in Dublin Core uh, is this might be, for example, if you're describing a film, Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm, uh, the source might be the book, Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm. Um, if you're talking about an adaptation, uh, or, you know, an audio recording of, you know, maybe perhaps an, an audio book or something like that. Again, I apologize that all my examples are audiovisual media based. Um, but uh, this is, you know, sort of a little bit more specific than relation um, as far as talking about kind of the relationship between one item and another. Uh, I see that there's a question about type for cataloging a DVD. Do we add multiple items, for example, image and sound? Uh, so for type, the Dublin Core controlled vocabulary lists, um, I believe includes audiovisual. Um, so you wouldn't have to do both image and sound. Uh, let me... Ah. Great example, Paul, a VHS videotape is a distribution mechanism for the film. So the film is the source. Uh, and yes, thank you, Shahed. There's a moving image for type. And we'll have about two more minutes before we come back together to talk about the exercise. All right, it is 
120. Uh, we have 10 minutes left in our session today. So I'm going to call everyone back together and ask uh, how you guys felt about the experience of doing this exercise. Um, does anybody feel like either sharing the, the work that you did uh, or sending me a copy of your form so that I can see it to share? Um, I'd be happy to kind of walk through it. Um, and how did people feel about uh, trying to capture audiovisual metadata in Dublin Core? Um, did it seem like, you know, were there things that you found that were missing um, when you made your lists? What kind of things did you want to capture that you weren't able to capture? Or was Dublin Core pretty much, uh, did it work pretty well for you as far as getting the information that you wanted to about your materials? Totally frustrated, didn't work well. Uh, too broad. Yeah, I mean, this is so much information just has to go in description. Um, the, oh, oh, this is a really good question, Sarah. The only reason I knew how to fill out most of these films is because I've seen a digitized version of the film. If I just had a VHS in front of me with no way to view it, I couldn't have filled out most of the form. Uh, that's a really great point and something that I should have touched on earlier with regards to audiovisual materials. Um, a lot of times, unlike with a book or with an image, um, when you're dealing with an audiovisual material, you have what looks like a blank cassette. And the only information that you have available to you uh, for how to, you know, what might be contained on it, what kind of information it might have, is you hope there's a label that has some information um, and what you can glean from the actual format of the material itself. Um, and you know the fact that this, what you can actually gain from looking at just a tape or looking at just a DVD is so limited, uh, should be pretty motivating when thinking about doing cataloging, right? Um, because the more metadata your predecessors leave for you and the more you can leave for the next people down the line, uh, the easier it is to kind of make those decisions about what to digitize um, and what to preserve and how to make it accessible. Um, so it's, uh, you know, there have been multiple situations that I've worked on in the past where an uh, organization or an institution has a big library of videos, you know, videotapes, and they want the most important ones digitized, but because they don't necessarily know without looking at them which the most important ones are, Either they have to, you know, kind of sit and watch a whole bunch of them to make decisions, or they have to just send the whole collection off and accept that, you know, many of the things that are, there might be duplicates in there, uh, there might be things that aren't what they say they are. Um, so as much metadata as you have to help you make those decisions in advance uh, is really crucial. Um, people have said it leaves out almost all technical info. That's true. Um, Dublin Core strength is its weakness. Is it's easy? Thank you, John and Amy. Uh, it's easy to use and hard to be specific. So for someone who's not an expert, um, you know, someone who's just you know starting to do wants to, or someone who is an expert but really wants you know kind of a quick and easy way just to get through as much cataloging as possible. Dublin Core serves a really important function, uh, and that was the goal of Dublin Core was to make sure that it was simple. Um, but this is why you know kind of looking at Dublin Core and trying to find uh, inf you know, ways to capture the information that they felt was key for their audiovisual materials is why the people who developed PP Core um, decided to do it the way that they did. They were really kind of trying to find that middle ground between something that's easy to use and something that provides uh, specific technical information in a way that can be you know, easily tracked, machine read, and easy to understand. Um, and certainly PP Core has flaws and we'll discover some of those as we go on as well. And there are things in it that don't necessarily make sense. And I'm sure many questions and frustrations that you'll have when we get to trying to catalog in PP Core in the next couple of weeks. Um, but the general underlying principle in most cases is almost always trying to find that balance between uh, making it simple, making it flexible uh, and making it specific. Um, question about where to put duration found. Um, yeah, uh, Dublin Core doesn't give you an opportunity for Mahoney, uh, Mahoney, I'm sorry, I'm mispronouncing that name, 
uh, it doesn't give you an opportunity for anywhere to put duration. Um, a lot of that technical information, uh, I mean, in Dublin Core, it would probably recommend that you put information like duration uh, as a note, maybe in format, um, and just kind of provide a lot of that information when talking about the format. But if, for example, the reason that we specify out duration uh, is when you're running a database, when you're looking at your collection, sometimes you might want to know the duration of all the items in your collection. So you can say, uh, we have 1,100 hours of material in our collection. And you can't do that if all that information is just kind of put, you know, as part of a bunch of other data into a broad format field. Um, oh, really good question, Sarah, about whether publisher applies to AV material. Um, so publisher generally does apply to AV material, but there's sort of different kinds of publishers for audiovisual material. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about it and let me jump back to the elements in PB Core. Um, so if you look at the PB Core asset elements, we have creator, contributor, and publisher. Um, and we have, in addition to a field for publisher, a field for publisher role. So you might have the, you know, when we're talking about public media, which again is the context with which I'm most familiar. Um, you might have the station that produced and published the content. Um, you might have a different organization that distributes the content. That's a different kind of publisher. Um, so if, you know, one thing that we do here at GBH is we distribute Masterpiece Theater. We don't quote unquote publish Masterpiece Theater. Masterpiece Theater is created by the BBC. Um, they are the publishers of that content. But because we distribute it in the United States, we are also the publishers of that content. And so, you know, the publisher role for us here would be distributor. Um, Carolyn asks if I digitize and publish a VHS from 1993 that was created by the local public information office. Am I the publisher uh, or the PIO? Uh, that's a great question. Um, generally speaking, the publisher field is meant to indicate the original publisher of that media or someone who kind of holds formal publication rights to it. Uh, and part of the reason that it's interesting and important to capture that metadata uh, is knowing the publisher helps you determine the right situation of that media. So if you wanted to reuse it for something, um, then you'd probably wanna go back to that metadata and determine the publisher. Um, and that's sort of the creator, contributor, and publisher are all sort of, even though we have specific fields for rights metadata where hopefully you can capture a lot of that information about the rights of a media, uh, knowing the creators and contributors and publishers involved in making, in creating a piece uh, will help you sort out some of the complexities of that right situation if you don't have a right summary that you're just able to put into that metadata. Um, so if I, as just kind of a, a standard human, digitize something and put it on my website, uh, I have quote unquote published it, but I haven't published it in a legal basis necessarily because I don't really have the rights to do that. So the fact that I put it on my website and digitize, that I digitized it and put it on my website doesn't really impact the legal history of that media in such a way that it's necessarily important to record it in the metadata. But there may be situations where that's not true. Um, and I do believe that within US copyright, if I was the creator and I digitized it and put it up, oh, I see what you mean, sir. Uh, Carolyn, if you're the city employee and you have the rights and you digitize and publish it, uh, that's probably a different situation. So as I was about to say, if you're a person who has the rights, to a piece of media and you put it up and you uh, make it available publicly, that can, I believe, in some cases be counted as publishing it. Um, and then that would change the situation as far as, you know, uh, within US copyright law, published and unpublished works um, may have different aspects as to when they go into public domain um, and when those rights expire and how people need to apply for rights. Um, and so it, it, all of those elements change the complexities of what you can actually do with the media. Um, can I explain this a little from the AV perspective? There are a lot of copyright aspects to a video recording. We are also uh, one minute from time, um, but this is a really interesting question uh, and the rights do impact a lot of what you can do with audiovisual media. Um, I'll tell you what, uh, I'm not gonna, explain this now because we're just about at the end of our session today, but I will take some time to talk about it a little more next week when we're kind of going through the asset elements and we can linger a little bit on rights 
uh, and talk about, you know, rights summary and rights link and rights embedded and what the different kind of rights are that may impact on audiovisual, audiovisual materials. Um, so we are at time now. Uh, I am happy to hang out a little more and answer any questions that people have. Um, so let me jump to the end of my presentation. Ah, sorry about that. So our next webinar will be next week, same time, 12.30 p.m. Eastern Standard. Um, and we're gonna be talking about the structure of PB Corp. Uh, if you want to do any optional homework, um, you can email me at rebeccaframeout at wgbh.org with an underscore in the middle. Um, feel free to complete or send me either the Dublin Core cataloging form that you tried to complete during the exercise today or to complete a different one and send it to me for review. Uh, and we can you know, have a little email correspondence about it. Um, as I mentioned earlier, during the final class, we're also going to be talking about case studies from students in the class. Uh, I know a couple of you already volunteered to provide a case study, and I'll be reaching out to you over the course of this week uh, to give you a little more information about that. Uh, if you have any questions or case studies that you would like me to talk about, having kind of experienced the first of these sessions, uh, feel free to send it to me at any time, um, or any questions that you'd like me specifically to talk about next week. Thank you guys again for joining today. I'm looking forward to seeing all of you uh, next Wednesday. And we'll be getting out in, you know, getting a little bit more specific uh, into the deep dive on PV Corp. Thank you, everyone. Have a great afternoon.